I've been a consultant neurologist for eight years. I work in the University of Oxford uh, at the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neuroscience and uh, I'm the co-investigator uh, of the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre. I look after quite a lot of people with Parkinson's and related movement disorders. Um, and I've always been interested in research in Parkinson's. Um, but about two years ago, I made a more formal sidestep to doing more research. And that really stemmed from my clinical involvement with patients. I mean, the reason I do my job and the thing that really motivates me is that after you've looked after a number of people, as I have through the years, probably eight years now, and made the initial diagnosis of Parkinson's, followed an individual and cared for them through the moderate and then the advanced stages, um, after a while, you get a bit fed up with what you can offer patients. Um, and so I got more interested in research as a way to potentially start to look at how we could develop better symptomatic treatments for, for individuals with Parkinson's that were really tailored towards relevant endpoints for individuals rather than pharma companies. Um, and, and also looking at how we could actually ultimately cure this, this condition. So I think what I'd most like people to take home after tonight and hopefully to be inspired by is firstly finding out a bit more about the innovative wearable technologies that are starting to come out into the research market and the commercial market that provide a very exciting way of monitoring a person with Parkinson's in terms of symptom fluctuation and give a much better snapshot of how things are doing for them over a longer period of time uh, than a single clinic visit, which they may only only be able to access once or twice a year. And I think the second very exciting thing for me uh, is the potential to actually prevent people at risk uh, of getting Parkinson's in the future. So really earlier diagnosis, earlier treatment intervention and ultimately delaying or even preventing uh, onset of Parkinson's itself. I think that we have the potential over the next decade to start to develop better symptomatic treatments, to monitor the effects of newer treatments, and to understand individual differences in how people present with their Parkinson's and progress on a, in a better way. I think that moving forward, a cure is probably going to be a bit longer on, on, on the horizon than a decade, but I think it will involve targeting people who are at risk, at high risk, actually, of developing Parkinson's in the future for interventional treatments to prevent them from getting motor Parkinson's in the very first place. So I think understanding the path from, you know, changing from an individual who has an individual lifelong risk of getting Parkinson's, but not yet any motor symptoms, to actually developing and being given a diagnosis of Parkinson's, understanding that pathway, developing markers to diagnose and chart that, and then to start with treatments, probably initially on a global collaborative uh, way, on a global collaborative scale, it will lead to a cure ultimately. I think a cure for many individuals actually means hope, hope over and above what we have in terms of symptomatic treatment. And many, many of the patients I look after who kindly take part in research, they're very aware actually that our research isn't necessarily going to benefit them personally, but knowing that it's going to benefit someone else in the future is the reason that they do it. So I think that, that the potential for a cure brings increased hope about tackling this condition long term. So I'd like to start by just thanking Parkinson's UK and the organisers for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing in Oxford. And I'd like to start with a short two minute video, which I think very much uh, highlights the issues facing someone recently diagnosed with Parkinson's and some of the challenges in delivering individually treat, uh, tailored treatments for these, for these people. So what I'm going to be doing, um, hopefully in the talk, I'm just going to be summarising what I'm going to tell you tonight. The first thing is the main issues facing people recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. 
uh, talking a bit about the barriers to providing personalised treatments and looking at why some individuals vary so tremendously from others <coughs> in how they present with their Parkinson's and how they are a year later. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre cohort and how this is helping to look at these individual differences. I'm going to talk about some of the new cutting-edge technologies that are starting to come out on the market and in research as tools to measure fluctuations hour by hour for people with Parkinson's and their individual progression. I'm going to think about how we can use these future technologies to develop better personalised treatments. And I'm going to end by talking about how research can ultimately prevent people, as Alistair has been talking, who have a higher risk of developing uh, Parkinson's in the future, but how research can identify these individuals so that they actually don't go on to develop Parkinson's at all. So thinking about the video, what people often tell me in clinic when I've just had to give them a diagnosis of Parkinson's are things like, will my memory or thought processes be affected? What treatments are available? What are the pros and cons? What are the side effects that I can expect? Where will I be in the future? Will I still be working? Or will I be dependent on a wheelchair to get around and leave the house? And in addition to tablet treatments, what about other exercises and supportive <coughs> therapies and lifestyle modifications? Where, where do they come in? And in a typical day for me, I'll see 16 people with Parkinson's during my clinic. And I'm still amazed at the difference from one person to the next that walks into my door every 20 to 30 minutes, the personal differences in how their Parkinson's has affected them at the time of diagnosis, where they are 5, 10 and 15 years later. And of course they always ask when they're going to see me next. So when we're thinking about barriers of delivering personalised treatments, as Alistair's already said, we are getting older. Our population currently has 10 million people aged 65 and above, and that's the key age to develop Parkinson's. And at the latest projections, this is going to double by 2050. So this graph shows you the number of people with Parkinson's currently under the care of a Parkinson's specialist nurse in Oxfordshire alone. So we now have 1,000 patients since this service was set up. Another barrier is the fact that if you see your neurologist or Parkinson's specialist or nurse, you may only see them once or twice a year during a 20-minute appointment that is a very, very brief and inadequate snapshot of your Parkinson's in the previous year. It's very difficult with limited time and resource to get a very clear picture of your overall Parkinson's in the previous 12 months. And of course, the advantage of the Parkinson's specialist nurse is you'll have a very different viewpoint when you're seen in your own home as opposed to being in the clinic. So how do we start to appreciate some of these individual striking differences from one person to the next with Parkinson's? So the Discovery Cohort, which uh, is led by Richard Wayne Martin and, and myself, was set up four years ago to really try and capture as representative a sample of people with Parkinson's and look at these differences, look at how we can predict how people respond to treatment and progress. The overall vision of the Oxford Parkinson's Centre is to identify the earliest changes, to allow earlier diagnosis, and earlier treatment interventions, ultimately to prevent the disease onset of Parkinson's. It's based around three interlapping themes that are best summarised in this slide. So starting first with the patient, we are looking at a large cohort of individuals recently diagnosed, and we're going to be following them up over 18 months, now over a 10-year period. So this is one of the best studied best phenotyped and longest study of its kind in the world. We're also looking at how we can develop better patient models of Parkinson's. And what you're seeing here are patient brain cells, which we've actually taken from a simple low-risk skin biopsy and grown in the Stem Cell Institute into induced pluripotent stem cells. So now, without having to put you through a dangerous brain biopsy, we can study the neurons in your brain for why they die and look at treatments that prolong their survival. We need more relevant animal models to test 
and validate newer treatments, ones that are relevant to people with Parkinson's, where aging is one of the biggest risks for you developing Parkinson's and progressing more quickly. Most mouse and rat models haven't been aged long enough naturally to really look at the effect of aging. So, as Steve said, a uh, long time ago, I got a tiny innovation grant to look at how well people with uh, Parkinson's were managed in the community of Milton Keynes. And what we found is that 90% of people living with Parkinson's in the community do come to see a specialist, and it's usually in their district general hospital. And based on that model, We've now extended the cohort to 11 hospitals throughout the Thames Valley in a population base of 2.1 million people. And we've tried very hard to capture as representative a sample of people with Parkinson's because we're not interested in super Parkinson's controls who can jump in a car, drive long distances, have a lumbar puncture every, every six months get into you know, um, scanners. We're, we're actually interested in capturing a representative sample of people with Parkinson's, both mildly to moderate to severely affected as possible. And so you don't have to travel too far if you live in the Thames Valley to get involved with our research. And so, uh, so far, we're, we've recruited nearly all of our 300 control subjects, and these are largely um, partners of people with Parkinson's, because they're often coming to the clinic anyway for the research. We've recruited about a thousand of people with early Parkinson's, and we're particularly in, uh, uh, interested in people who are at risk of future Parkinson's. So, so far we have about a hundred brothers and sisters of people with Parkinson's who have a genetic risk that me makes them three times uh, more likely to manifest Parkinson's in their lifetime. We also are very interested in people with a sleep behaviour problem. I'm going to show a video later about what this actually means. But we call this rapid eye movement sleep behaviour disorder. And because this is a longitudinal study, <coughs> when you sign up to our research, we want to see you every 18 months over the next 6 to 10 year period. So what the main take home message of this slide is firstly that it's longitudinal and that we can give 10 year follow up through the cohort. But secondly, we're using a variety of different assessments. Some of these are questionnaires that the individual will fill in at home. Some are doctor rated, some are nurse rated in the clinic. But they are a mixture of both subjective scales, like the Parkinson's rating scale Alistair showed you, as well as more quantifiable motor and other forms of testing. And we ask people if they're happy to give a blood test, so we collect biomarker data. So, really, to thank everybody, some of many of whom actually are here in the audience, uh, for taking part in our research, for giving of their time generously, and for persuading their family and friends to take part. And so from one individual, we can collect a wealth of data. We can look at their phenotype information. We actually use uh, felt tip pens to, to test smell, which are a lot cheaper than the scratch and sniff test you've just used, which is about $45 a pop. We can reuse these. They cost 50 pounds and can be reused indefinitely for up to a year. We also, from the same individual, can uh, offer them the opportunity to, to consider doing other tests so a brain scan, skin biopsy, a lumbar puncture, blood test, and we're looking at their DNA or genetic code for family risks that predispose to Parkinson's. So just to summarize what we found so far, the first thing is that your age and gender influence your Parkinson's. The older you are, uh, the more likely you are to, to manifest Parkinson's, and unfortunately you tend to progress quickly, more quickly than younger people with Parkinson's. There's a male-female gender difference. If you're a male, you tend to have more upper body symmetrical Parkinson's, and if you're a lady, you tend to have more lower body postural and balance problems earlier on. We've also found that sleep matters. If you have Parkinson's, even within the first three years, 50% of you will have significant REM sleep behaviour disorder. And if you have that with your Parkinson's, you have worse problems in other non-motor aspects like memory, mood, depression, and daytime sleepiness. 
And lastly, we've piloted global assessment screening tools of memory function. And we found that the Montreal Cognitive Assessment is much more sensitive to pick up earlier changes than the mini mental state examination at diagnosis and also longitudinally when people, the same individuals, are followed up. What we did next was say, actually, we haven't used half of the information that we've collected during our two to three hour visit. And we've kind of thought that maybe sleep uh, and memory was important, but there could be a lot of other aspects that lead to these individual differences. So what we've done now is a complex statistical technique where for the first 700 people with Parkinson's, we've taken all their information in an unbiased way using a data-driven approach and we've looked at the factors that best describe the differences between individuals. And these can be divided into psychological well-being factors like apathy, pain, fatigue, depression and anxiety, what we call non-tremor motor features, which are mainly stiffness, speech, rigidity and balance issues, and lastly, memory factors. And in these first 703 individuals with Parkinson's, <coughs> we can assign each individual to one of these five clusters based on how they score. Now on this scale, a minus number means you're doing relatively better, and a plus, you're doing worse. So what you're seeing here is the first group of 30% of people are generally doing well. They have mild Parkinson's compared to everyone else across a range of motor, non-motor and memory features. The second group, they're doing particularly badly in memory and balance. The third group, 24%, are driven by having bad tremor. But their other uh, non-motor features of Parkinson's are relatively good. So this is what we would call a tremor-dominant form of Parkinson's. This group have very bad REM sleep behavior disorder, certainly at their baseline at diagnosis, but not too bad in the other factors. This last group of 10% do particularly badly in all aspects of their Parkinson's, their memory, their motor function, their non-motor function. And although this is a single baseline snapshot, my prediction is that these individuals will progress much more quickly than the others. And what I would say is that if we gave a, a promising drug to 100 individuals with Parkinson's, and it only worked in that 10% or 10 individuals, your overall result would be negative and you would be missing very important benefit that might only be happening with perhaps one or two subgroups. So I think to design better treatment trials for Parkinson's, we need to start to appreciate these differences. We have a lot of work to do on this. We need to validate our statistical methods we need to go on and see whether we can replicate this in a second cohort of people with Parkinson's. We're going to be doing that in the next year with the tracking Parkinson's data set. And importantly, we need to follow people up to see whether you change maybe from one cluster to another or whether your baseline phenotype predicts where you'll be five years or ten years down the line. So this has great translational relevance really from the clinic and bedside to patients. And I'm very excited about how we can start to develop this model. Just to now talk a little bit about cutting edge technologies for Parkinson's. I don't need to tell people in this room about many of the constellation of different symptoms that occur, but also the fact that fluctuations going from on to off as medication starts to wear off or becomes less reliable in its effect they start to become more of a problem as Parkinson's progresses, but they're also there even at the time of diagnosis. So how do we best measure and assess this when fluctuations are one of the most unpredictable and anxiety provoking things for the individual with Parkinson's? Bearing in mind that more and more people are gonna be affected over the next two decades, so we have less resource to actually look at this complex picture that's emerging. So I think one of the potential solutions are wearable technologies, a bit like a wristwatch or an Android smartphone that we're now piloting in Oxford. We have the potential now in this three minute Android smartphone app to actually start to get a better window. 
And with this three minute test, which can be downloaded onto your mobile phone, which you can then take home, you could perform the test four times a day over a week or a month, uh, we get a very good handle on fluctuations. So this three minute Android app, which has been developed by Max Little, who also set up the Parkinson Voice Initiative, allows a voice recording, and initial data suggests that early changes in the Parkinson voice can distinguish up to 99% of people from Parkinson's from those without Parkinson's. So that's a simple 10 second voice recording. We then combine that with a balance test, a gait test, where the phone is simply slipped into the back pocket and the subject walks 10 meters and turns. We can also use it to measure manual dexterity, a bit similar to Alistair's test, and reaction times. And we can also use it to even record tremor through the accelerometer device on the smartphone app and global positioning. So this three minute test has never really been validated before on this sort of scale of people with Parkinson's. The very exciting thing would be whether it actually detects people in the premotor phase. Uh, and it could be used potentially to population screen thousands of individuals who would never even need to go near a neurology clinic, who could do a quick three minute online recording or via their phone. Now, of course, there are lots of other devices currently in development by Michael J. Fox. Uh, and I will just uh, also mention Global Kinetics, which is an Australian company who've developed a PKG logger device that may be able to distinguish Parkinson's dyskinesias from Parkinson's tremor. And that would be very useful when we're starting to assess patients for more complex treatments for Parkinson's, such as deep brain stimulation, such as duodopa and apomorphine. So I think these are exciting technologies. But what about the future? Can we actually dream about preventing Parkinson's altogether? Alistair's talked about uh, individual problems with reduced smell and REM sleep behaviour disorder. And in Oxford, we've become very interested in people with REM sleep behaviour disorder. Now, the, the video, uh, everybody shown here is given permission to be, to be filmed and for this to be shown. This person is in deep sleep and he's now going into a REM sleep behaviour disorder episode. He's shouting, he's having a nightmare. He's very distressed and he might, he's actually fighting the pillow off. If you were the bed partner of this person, you'd be woken up <laughs> you might end up with a black eye. I've had somebody fell out of bed, hit their eye on the bed table and went blind because they got a retinal detachment. So this is not a benign condition in its own right. So what you say, but actually, if you follow people diagnosed with REM sleep behaviour disorder on this sort of overnight sleep study, 80% of them will develop either Parkinson's or a related disorder over the next 15 years. This is one of the highest <coughs> conversion rates that's greater even than people with ge rare genetic causes of Parkinson's. And this person is a patient of mine from Milton Keynes who came to me at the age of 63 years with this problem. I examined him very carefully. He had absolutely no motor features of Parkinson's, but two years later came back with early Parkinson's. So in two years' time, he'd converted from REM sleep behaviour disorder to motoric Parkinson's and is now on treatment. So my research fellow, Harry Rilinski, has worked very hard going through sleep clinics throughout the country, both at Papworth, Oxford, and more, most recently Sheffield, and 60 people approximately with REM sleep behaviour disorder have taken part in our research. And what we've found is that they've already started to show very early, subtle motor features of Parkinson's when you compare them to control subjects of the same age and gender. These features, such as stiffness, slowness of movement and tremor, are nowhere near the type of abnormality we see in people with a diagnosis of Parkinson's, but they're different from healthy controls. Patients with REM sleep behaviour disorder also have a full house of non-motor features of early Parkinson's. Their sense of smell, their memory, their constipation, their depression anxiety is far worse than a healthy control of the same age and gender. Furthermore, if you do detailed memory testing on these individuals, we see subtle early memory changes in visual working memory 
that are indistinguishable from people with early Parkinson's. So increasingly, our feeling in Oxford is that people with RBD are effectively people with early Parkinson's. And therefore, if we were to collaborate by internationally working together with sleep neurologists to collect people with RBD, we may get enough numbers to actually do an interventional treatment trial in these people. So what about the future? To summarise, I think that earlier diagnosis in this premotor phase in somebody, for example, with REM sleep behaviour disorder is one of the best chances of a cure to prevent somebody with RBD going on to develop Parkinson's. Individually tailored treatments are becoming possible with technological advances, innovative approaches such as the smartphone apps uh, and the wearable uh, wrist actigraphs. Better monitoring of symptoms and progression will enable better symptomatic treatments and importantly it will help us to assess what's meaningful for patients when we're designing drug trials. But effective research has to become more collaborative and I think I'm not really just talking here about collaboration on a national scale uh, but really on, a, on an international scale to truly deliver for people with Parkinson's. So thank you very much. <laughs>